I'm going to follow up uh, on Luke with many of the same observations and the data that we are sharing and we are analyzing uh, jointly. But you see that I'm going to reach conclusions which are eventually somewhat different. We work together on the World Development Report. In a sense, the puzzle is why is it that uh, agriculture remains so badly neglected when the World Development Report was written in 2008 there were about three countries that were meeting the uh, CADEP goal of uh, spending no less than 10% of government budget on agriculture. What we see is it went up to 10. I'm not claiming causality after the World Development Report. The world food crisis came. I think food riots were more convincing than reading a report. The number of countries that met this uh, goal of, of 10% climbed to, to 10. If you look at it today, we are down to 2 so this sort of a puzzle of the neglect of agriculture, if you look at what's happening with yield that you see on this graph, you see that Sub-Saharan Africa is lagging behind, which suggests in a sense there is a kind of trap of low adoption which needs to be understood. So what I would like to do in the presentation today is to say, well, technology upgrading is necessary. There is population growth, there is declining farm size. The answer has to be technology in order for agriculture to perform its role. At the same time, there have been adoption failures. And the, the failures cannot be blamed on kind of ignorance or bad policies. Most likely, the reason why agriculture has not been invested in more is because it has failed to deliver in terms of attempts at pushing technology, promoting technology adoption. You see it's not happening. Governments turn their attention elsewhere and look for other opportunities. So the blame is in a sense, is in a sense not on ignorance and bad policy. The blame is on, on the fact that the recommendations that were made as to how to do it were probably not the right ones. And as a consequence, what we need to do is go back to the, to the design board and uh, find uh, other options that could be proposed as to how to be more successful with technology adoption. So I want to look at the way, in fact, technology adoption has been sought, and which has largely been following what I would call a supply-driven approach, which would say technologies are ex exist and are available for adoption, are presumably profitable. So let's look at the demand side as to what, is, what are the constraints on adoption of this existing technology. I'm going to show with data that where technology adoption has happened pretty well uh, reaches a ceiling, which is going to be 30 40% at most, quite often much less than that, which tells us in a sense that, well, this supply side approach may not be sufficient. We need a more, much more demand side approach, namely identify what kind of demand there is for technology, what kind of traits and what kind of aspects of technology would farmers like to have, and then go to the supply side and corresponding, correspondingly develop the technologies that are going to meet this demand. So I'm going to proceed in, ten, in seven steps. The first one is to say, role of agriculture will recognize the WDR, also the work that has, has been done in terms of poverty, the uh, sustainable development goals, which uh, have the objective as number one, to eliminate absolute poverty. This poverty is mainly rural and agriculture. So there's clearly a very strong emphasis on the agriculture and rural areas. You could say this is a selection issue, that people who fail to escape poverty remain in agriculture and the the solution to poverty is to take people out of agriculture. What we see and look has been important in, in that, in looking at the data, is in fact that poverty reduction has to a very significant extent happen in the rural areas and with agriculture and not by moving people outside of agriculture. Right? So what we see is, a, is an increasing yield gap and we see that labor productivity is, is, is low. My second uh, step is to say, well, why are rural households poor? And there's something quite interesting here is, is that we would say, well, poverty depends on labor productivity, but labor productivity can be measured in two ways. Either we can measure labor productivity per year, or we can measure labor productivity when people work. And we, if we do the latter, what we see is that the gap between urban and rural labor productivity per hour worked is not very different. And it is very large when you me measure it on a per hour basis, which in a sense, takes us to this idea that there is something wrong with the labor calendars, that here at peak time, you can see the, the upper curve is the urban uh, hours worked per week. The lower one is the rural areas. At peak time, which is in this case the uh, planting time, more or less there is a, a similar level of occupation. But as soon as you 
uh, are not at that peak period. There's a large gap in employment opportunities between the two. And the labor calendars, as a consequence, are the key reason why rural households are key, is that there are, there's a lack of employment opportunities else at a few periods of the year. And here what you see, in a sense, is the, for example, the bottom graph, you can see that you can add to, a, which is when there is a, uh, a, a household enterprise in the household, it adds to the labor demands, but it does not create counter-cyclicality. So there are very few activities in agriculture which are counter-cyclical to agriculture, which means that, in a sense, interestingly, and Catherine is going to go to the issue of kind of household level decision making, what it means is that people are not switching activities. They are going to specialize in different activities, uh, each in a, one in agriculture, others in, for example, uh, off-farm uh, income activities or, or transformation activities or, or livestock. But it's very difficult to smooth labor calendars in agriculture, in the rural areas, w w w through finding activities which are counter-cyclical to agriculture. So what I'm concluding here is that there is a key role to play to how we look at the labor calendars. And for that, what we need is to go beyond the productivity of staple crops, as uh, Luke was mentioning, the Green Revolution, and to look at what we call here the agriculture and the, and the rural transformation. The ag transformation is basically a diversification of farming systems, kind of spreading the use of labor across the year with crops that succeed each other and as a consequence create labor opportunities in more months of the year. And the rural transformation is to look for off-farm sources of income that can be uh, co complements to ag agricultural activity, not as, as a, in a counter-cyclical fashion as I have shown, but as a complement to what agricultural ag uh, employment offers. And as a consequence, some members of the household can specialize in those uh, activities. So the sequence that we are proposing here is to say, well, it's important to have the Green Revolution. It's an important starting point. It's, it's, it uses a lot of the land. It employs a lot of the labor. But we have to move on beyond this to ag transformation and to rural transformation in order to spread the labor calendars and provide complementary sources of income. If we look at the way technology has been made available for adoption, basically we see two different two different strategies. One, one is a sort of supply-driven strategy, which I was saying before, assumes that technology is available, seeds, fertilizer, for adoption, and uh, that it's a matter of kind of identifying the constraints on demand and addressing each of those constraints on demand in order for technology to be adopted. The other alternative is to say, well, no, that's not necessarily the case, that those technologies that seem to be profitable are not, in fact, profitable for many in part because they need complementary factors to the, to the technology which is being offered. And as a consequence, we need to go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves, well, what, what are the, what, for example, what do the extreme non-adopters, the extreme non-adopters are sort of your marginal non-adopters, people whom you think should be adopting who are in fact non-adopting, and trying to figure out why is it that they are not adopting what you are proposing them to adopt, and what is it that they would like to see in what is being offered, which is different from what is, is currently being, being offered. Right? And then once the, this sort of needs assessment has been done to go back to the drawing board in terms of supply, not to start with the supply, but to start with demand, and then co correspondingly deliver the kinds of technology and farming systems which are going to meet the uh, expectations and the demands of farmers. Right? So this technology improvement, call it the Green Revolution, is actually quite complex in Rain-fed agriculture, 94% of the area in sub-Saharan Africa is rain-fed. Rain-fed means with a lot of heterogeneity. There's a lot of complementary factors that have to be mobilized in order to make the technology uh, acceptable. For example, if you we look at fertilizer, what you see is that the fertilizer as currently offered is only acceptable to maybe 30, 40% of the land because it lacks either soil fertility or it lacks kind of management of uh, soil acidity. And as a consequence, without packaging the fertilizer with those other complementary factors, there is not going to be adoption. The fertilizer is not profitable without those complementary interventions, which means in a sense the need to customize the offer of technology to local conditions, which is part of the difficulty. So a supply-driven strategy would say, well, let's start from this heterogeneity 
So sorry. So what uh, my, my next step here is to say, well, this supply-driven strategy has been addressed to a very significant extent, especially using randomized controlled trials. A lot of the work done under ATI with support of uh, DFID and the, and the Gates Foundation, which has, in a sense, identified many ways of lifting the constraints on demand, either in terms of behavior or in terms of market access or in terms of access to credit, in terms of access to insurance. Uh, and as a consequence, being able to relax those demand constraints on the technology which is currently available. But what we see is that we reach typically a ceiling, which is going to be 30-40% at most, quite often much less than that, which then tells us that in the end, the technology which was made available for adoption may not be the one that was necessary and needed and desired by, by a majority of the farmers. So that takes us to the demand side, namely, how do we start with identifying demand? And there have been efforts, and pair at uh, the work that you did in the old times at SIAT, the work of participatory breeding, the work in terms of CL, the kind of participatory research with groups of farmers, the use of the farmer field schools, all of those were kind of efforts to try to elicit demand in order to identify what kind of technology would be necessary, right? Usually the approach was too narrow, was focusing too quickly on the expected solutions to, to the technological uh, gap, instead of starting with the problem. The problem in a sense should be not low yield, but maybe poverty, and to say, well, if farmers are poor, what is it that they would like to have in terms of technology that would overcome the constraints to improving incomes, right? There's an interesting approach that we were just discussing with Justin Lin, the so-called science and technology backyard, backyard platforms in China. But what you do is you take teams of scientists, to the field and jointly identify with the farmers what are the presumed constraints on adoption. And the presumed constraints on adoption may not be kind of narrowly technological or credit or insurance. They may be much broader, such as infrastructure, such as behavior, such as understanding and, and information. Right? So I think what we need to do is to go back to the drawing board of technology to, in order to identify what is the unmet demand and start investing in technology on the supply side only after we have correspondingly uh, addressed what, what is it that uh, research should be addressing. So in conclusion, we say that a green revolution for good quality rain fed sub-Saharan Africa is necessary but hard to achieve due to heterogeneity of conditions. So the, the main difficulty with the demand side, in a sense, is that we are talking about customization because we are talking about heterogeneity. On the other hand, there are Research is costly, and so there are huge economies of scale in investing in research. Right? The reason why it works so easily with the Green Revolution is that it addressed irrigated farming, where you have large areas which have similar conditions, and you can invest in a technological package which is going to be applied very extensively in terms of area. So you can, you can capture economies of scale. As soon as you customize, what you do is you go to a situation where you recognize heterogeneity, so pretty quickly you are going to face issues of economies of scale. Can you actually cost effectively develop those new technologies given the fact that demand is atomized and hence your technological solutions need to be customized and each customization effort is going to have a cost which is going to meet eventually reduced demand because of the, so, of the heterogeneity of conditions under which technology is being used. Right? So what I'm saying here is that we need to kind of go back to the drawing board to look at not only how to break the constraints on demand to a, su a supply-driven technological effort, but how to design a demand-driven strategy which is going to be able to address the uh, economies of scale in research, which is a big challenge. The CGIR has importantly invested into this in the past. It has met with strong limitations. There has been, if anything, a move away from the participatory research participatory breeding from the CL approach from the farmer field school. And what we need to do is to find kind of new ways, especially using IT, in order to be able to make more scale effective, cost effective from a, an economies of scale pr perspective, the fact of customizing the supply of technology to the heterogeneity of demand, right? So that's my conclusion at the end. I think the reason why we see a neglect of agriculture and a lack of technological progress may not be so much because of misunderstanding in terms of the recommendations to invest more in agriculture, but the fact that the way we have proposed the investment in agriculture was not cost effective, did not meet the demands for technology, 
has to correspond to what farmers have, we need to go back to the drawing board for this to engage into more participatory research, but to find new institutional designs in order to do this in a cost-effective fashion. So thank you very much. Thank you.